son Christian loves to play sports, which is just as well because we live in Texas. And when we moved to Texas, I realized that football comes just slightly below your relationship with God. I'll never forget the first time I saw him just as a little boy, fully suited up with those huge shoulder pads and the helmet. And he said to me, Mom, I don't care what it looks like out there, how bad it looks, do not come on the field. Well, I tried for a while, but one particular game, something happened that was just ridiculous. A boy had tackled Christian, and so he'd fallen face down, which was cool. But then another boy came up behind him and stomped on the back of his knee purposely. I heard Christian cry out from the bleachers. Literally, Barry had to hold on to the tail of my coat to stop me just leaping over the fence. We had to have surgery after that. He'd torn a disc in his knee. But the surgeon said, you know, if you rehab well, you should be able to play football next season. And maybe you can do some spring soccer. Well, when that came around, we were sitting at maybe his second game, and I was watching Christian dribble a ball, and all of a sudden, that right knee just buckled underneath him, and he went down. And I knew it was bad. He had to have a second surgery, and it was even worse than the first time. And his surgeon said to him, I'm sorry, Christian, but your football days are over. Christian was disappointed, obviously, but there's other sports he can play. I'm hoping for one that's a little less dangerous, but not all disappointment is like that. Some disappointment is literally crippling. You don't even see it coming. It's almost like a storm that blows in and will not move. Maybe you've been going through that for years. Well, one of the things I've learned in my own life is to me, the level of disappointment you experience is really in relation to how much hope you've invested in that. That's what we're going to look at in this next lesson. We've all been disappointed over one thing or another. Sure, some disappointments are more intense than others, but we all have things in our lives that have let us down. As we look into God's word in this session, we're going to take a look at a woman who experienced profound disappointment, not just for a season, but year after year. But she found redemption and a hope that could not be shaken by reaching out to Jesus. I believe that hope is available to every one of us. We find her story in Mark's Gospel, but we don't even know this woman's name. She's simply referred to as the woman with the issue of blood. If you have your Bibles, open them to Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, beginning at verse 25. Let's read the story of this woman who moved from crushing disappointment to overwhelming hope. I'm reading from the English Standard Translation. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who'd suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. There's no doubt this is a miraculous story. What I want us to see, though, is that the greatest miracle she received that day wasn't even one she was looking for, and she didn't even know that she needed. 
She wanted to be healed, but Jesus wanted to make her whole. The glorious thing about the grace of God seen in the face of Christ Jesus is that he sees beyond our cries to the very deepest longing of our hearts and answers prayers we didn't even have the wisdom to pray if we will listen for him. There are several things to note about this poor woman. First of all, she is suffering. The first thing that we read about this woman is that she has been bleeding constantly for 12 years. That's actually a condition called menorrhagia. I know a school teacher who has suffered from this for just two years. She's so weak and easily worn out. If she'll even get out of a chair too quickly, she can pass out. It's a very debilitating condition. This poor woman has been like this for 12 years. Mark tells us that she has used up every penny she has in an attempt to find a cure. And not only is she no better, she's actually worse. The Talmud offered 11 remedies that might bring relief, most of which seem quite strange to us today. For example, one treatment option was to find a corn husk in the droppings of a white she mule and carry it around with you and that might help her condition. Not sure I'll be going for that one. She is also, and perhaps even more tragic, she's an outcast. To me that seems far worse. Most of us are familiar with the Ten Commandments given to Moses and Mount Sinai, but those were just the Big Ten. There were actually 613 laws that applied to every Jewish man, woman, and child. The one that impacted this woman the most is actually found in the book of Leviticus, chapter 15, verses 25. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge, she shall continue in uncleanness, as in the days of her impurity, she shall be considered unclean. Think through what life must have been like for this woman. To be an outcast in biblical times. If she had been married, she can no longer touch her husband. Even to hold his hand would then make him ceremonially unclean. So I imagine she was probably living alone. She would undoubtedly be unable to have children. If you were her friend, you couldn't invite her to stop by for coffee because the chair she sat on would become unclean, as would the cup. If she began to slip and fall in the street, anyone who knew of her condition would not be able to stop her fall. She was also obliged to call out by law, unclean, if someone was about to bump into her and hadn't seen her. She was such an absolute outcast, not even welcome in the house of God. She was utterly alone. She was desperate. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been in a place where you think, there's no help for me, there's no hope? Someone once told me at a very dark time in my life that when the pain of remaining the same is greater than the pain of change, then you will change. And that's where she was, desperate. She had heard that this man Jesus was healing people and she also knew this was her moment. But even as she determined that she would push through the crowd and touch the hem of his garment, something happened. That might ruin it all. A prominent Jewish rabbi, Jairus, fell at the feet of Jesus on behalf of his 12-year-old daughter who was dying. He begged Jesus to go with him to his home. This girl was everything that the woman was not. She was loved. She was fought for. She was treasured. She was Jairus's daughter. This was a crossroads for this woman. Would she slip away again, even more bitterly disappointed? Or would she push through the crowd and touch Jesus? We all have these moments. Moments when we hear God calling us, 
and we know it's his voice. We know that he is asking us to step out in faith. Will we respond or slip away into the shadows? God lets us choose. Well, in that moment, with her heart pounding in her chest, she stepped toward Jesus. She reached through the crowd and touched just the hem of his garment. And immediately she felt in her body that she was healed. And Jesus felt it too. He felt that power had gone out of him. And he stopped and asked the question, Who touched me? The disciples thought the question was ridiculous as the crowd was pressing in on Jesus from every side. But Jesus waited. Many people touched him that day, but one touched him in faith. Jesus knew who had touched him, but he wasn't going to expose her. He waited. She could have slipped away unnoticed and presented herself to the priest in seven days and been declared clean. But I wonder, would she have lived the rest of her life wondering if she had stolen a miracle? So we read, but the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. The Greek word used here is the same word used just a few verses before her story in Mark 5 when a demon-possessed man fell at the feet of Jesus. The interpretation here is not simply someone tripping or collapsing. No, falling in worship, in humility, full of belief and understanding of her need for a healer. I love this line. She told him the whole truth. That simple statement makes me stop in my tracks. The whole truth. Have you ever done that? Have you ever poured out every ounce of the disappointment you carry? He will listen. He listened to her. I'm sure that Jairus and others were trying to get him to move on. But Jesus listened to this poor woman pour out the disappointment of years. Then he gave her a gift, a profound gift given to no one else recorded in scripture. He looked in her eyes and he called her daughter. What a gift to this lonely, broken woman who had not belonged anywhere for so long. Jesus was saying, you belong with me. You are family. I own her. Jesus told her to go in peace. Their faith had made her whole. She could have slipped away, but would she have gone in peace? Now Christ himself owned her before the whole community, declared that her faith had saved her and sent her home in peace. Many translations say, go in peace and be healed. But the minute she touched the edge of Christ's garment, the bleeding stopped. So what else needed to be healed? So much more. I believe she needed to be healed of all the tapes that had played in her head over and over again. I think she needed to be healed of the shame and the bitter disappointment. I think she needed to be healed of the self-hatred that the enemy must have used to torment her. When we limit salvation to a single act or commitment we make to Christ, we miss the beauty and depth of salvation. The Greek word for salvation is sozo, which means to save and to heal. He wants nothing less for each one of us. He wants nothing less for you. Christ's work in our lives is an ongoing process as he exposes the places where we're broken, where we've lost hope, and invites us to bring that to him. Let me ask you one more time. Have you ever told Jesus the 
whole truth? Have you told him about the things you've pushed deep into the cellar of your soul, hoping you never have to look at them again? Have you ever named out loud the disappointments in your life? Jesus wants to fill those places with his hope and make you whole. Those are the places that the enemy loves to torment us. Let's take that away from him. Tell Jesus the whole truth. Pour out everything that you see as ugly and unredeemable and experience the blessing of hearing him say in the deepest recesses of your heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Think about Jesus, the beloved Son of God, speaking to you with a fiery love. Daughter, loved one, adopted one, adored one, go in peace. This is a beautiful invitation. So what might hold you back? Are you stuck in the past viewing your life through the rear view mirror? Are you disappointed in yourself, in other people, maybe even in God? What's keeping you from telling Christ the whole truth? Don't allow the disappointments of yesterday to rob you of the hope of today. Although we will never understand this side of heaven, the depth of the love of God, as his precious daughters, we have a glorious invitation to trade our disappointments for the sure and certain hope we have in Christ. For years, this woman had been defined by one thing and one thing alone. She was a woman with an issue of blood. Now, she would be defined differently. She would no longer be defined by an issue, but by her identity as a daughter of God. When you're a child of God, there is an identity that no one can touch. For every no that you have received in life, each one is outweighed by the definitive yes that Christ accomplished on the cross. As Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. When Paul wrote to the church in Rome, he put the disappointments of this life into perspective as we look to our eternal home with Christ forever. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. He was very definitive in how he writes the last statement, this hope will not lead to disappointment. I love what theologian Miroslav Volf writes. Though our bodies and souls may become ravished, yet we continue to be God's temple. At times, a temple in ruins, but sacred space nonetheless. So today, right where you are, in the midst of your disappointment, in the middle of your shattered places, Will you let God redeem your ruins and renew your heart? You are daughter of the King. You are his beloved, no longer defined by your circumstances, but by your identity found only in Christ Jesus. And just like the woman we study today, remember that while you may be looking for one miracle, God may be up to something a lot more glorious than you could even to imagine.